Good morning, everybody, and welcome to God's house. We welcome those of you who are uh, watching us online. We continue in the uh, joy of Easter. Today is the uh, second Sunday in the season, and our theme is God is light, and in him there is no darkness. So we're going to begin with the opening song. It's an old hymn, and uh, we're going to sing, Come Christians, Join to Sing. So would you please stand as we begin worship. liturgy is printed out for you. We come together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. He remembers his covenant forever, the word he commanded for a thousand generations. Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has made him ruler over the works of his hands and put everything under his feet. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet, yet believe. Christ has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. With joy we sing. We sing the song of praise, let there be praise. We'll sing it through twice, and there is a key change, okay? <laughs> Let there be joy. 
And let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we gather together on this day, your day, the Lord's day, Resurrection Day. We continue to celebrate the fact that you are risen from the dead. Today, dear Lord, we thank you for the eyewitnesses of your life, the eyewitnesses of your passion, your sacrifice on the cross, your death, your burial. And we thank you for the eyewitnesses of your resurrection. Dear Lord, today we celebrate that you are the word of life and you have given us eternal life. Thank you for the fellowship we share with you and the Father and the Holy Spirit and with one another and fill us with joy. For you live and reign, dear Lord Jesus, even in our world today. Amen. Please greet, you, greet those around you and do the peace wave and say hello to one another. Good morning, Larry. Good morning. Good afternoon, whatever it may be. Take out your Bibles. Does everybody have a Bible? There are Bibles in the back. By the way, we've separated the Bibles for the early service and the late service. So if you don't have a Bible, wave your hand and we'll get Ben to get you one. Anybody need a Bible? Okay, Ben, you're good. So turn to uh, the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter. And uh, Lord willing, in the weeks ahead, we're going to use our hymn books. Remember the hymn books? Something you hold in your hand. So today's reading is uh, the assigned reading for today, and as we read it, I want you to focus on the reality, the real scene, okay? A lot of times we read these things and we don't really, I'm not sure we always think they're real. So I want you to focus on the marks of realness in the lesson for today. Is that vague? The marks of reality. Let me begin with verse 19, John chapter 20, and you can join me uh, as we come to the verse 24. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came, stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hand and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive, they are not forgiven. Join me, please. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I never believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. Did you notice the reality of the scene? What were some of the signs? How about behind locked doors? That's real. For fear of 
the Jews. And they came, Jesus comes, and they saw his, the signs in his body of the wounds of his crucifixion. And then what did, what did Thomas, by the way, was Jesus after Thomas? I think he was. He was out to get Thomas. And he says, Thomas, what? Put your hand in my side. Put your, put your hand in the wounds of my body. Touch me and see that I'm what? See that I'm what? Real. See that it's really me. Okay? This is all a setup for the lesson for today from 1 John. So would you turn to 1 John 1? You know, it's important to live in the real world, isn't it? Um, you know anybody who lives in a fantasy world? Huh? Maybe all of us do periodically. But think about that. The phantom world. The phantom world. All right, happy Easter to all of you. First John chapter 1, we're going to read it in a moment. Don't jump ahead. As we continue to celebrate the fact that Christ is risen indeed. Last Sunday, and I'm, I'm starting a theme here through Easter. Last Sunday, Mark's gospel ended quickly. Remember how it ended? The women are running away from the tomb. They don't say anything and they fled the tomb because they were afraid or terrified. And my question in that sermon last Sunday, so what's next? <laughs> and what's next is answered in part today with the lesson we read, but also what's next is what's next in your life and mine and the next generation. Will we follow Jesus? Will we become part of his mission and ministry? Okay, so let me read. We're going to take this in part. So we're going to take the first four verses, then come back at the end and read the rest. Uh, verse 1 through 4, let me read. John writes, 1 John, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. That life appeared. We have seen it, we testify to it, and we proclaim it to you, the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. So let's take the first verse, four verses. Notice the first three verses in the Greek are all one sentence. In our, in our translation, it's broken up. But it's one long sentence with three parts. Now you've got to think this way. One long sentence with three parts. Each part is what? Saying the same thing. Everybody got that? Basically, each part. Look at the first part. Look at verse 1. There's a forism there. That which was from the beginning. We'll come back to that. We have heard. We have seen with what? Our own very eyes. We have looked at. I love the word looked at. When you look at something, is it the same as seeing something? No. When you're looking at something, you're what? You're, I'm looking at you. I'm studying you, right? When you're looking at someone, or you're studying that person. You're wondering. That's exactly the word. It's much more than, oh, I looked or I saw. No, they studied him. And notice the fourth one. And we finally touched him, have touched him. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. Notice the fourth one. We heard, and it comes in the verse 2. Look at verse 2. The life appeared, we've seen it, we testify to it, we're coming to that, and proclaim it to you. But just think about that. What, what is the big point John's making in this? 
Credibility, thank you, John. And they were what? Eyewitnesses, you betcha. This wasn't a phantom. This was, Jesus was not a product of their imagination. They are eyewitnesses, and these, John is saying, we were there. This man we touched. We saw him. We heard him speak. We saw his miracles. We actually studied him, and we also touched him. What was the great example in the gospel lesson? Thomas actually what? Touched him. And Jesus said, you believe because you saw and touched me. Blessed are those who believe who do not have to do that. The point John is making is Jesus is not and was not a, fan, a phantom. Is that the right word? Phantom of our imagination. He was real flesh and blood. And I want to say to you, people of God, our faith has to do with real history. And John and the apostles, the men and women of Jesus that were with Jesus, the women, the crowd of women, remember them from last week, and, and the men, they are the eyewitnesses, and they give us the evidence that Jesus is real, that our faith is not a figment of creation. It is a real historic flesh and blood. We don't live in a fantasy world. We live in the world of God's reality, that God comes among us. And then if you go to verse 3, and we have fell and he has fellowship with us because our fellowship is with the father now we're coming to part 2 of the sermon fellowship anybody know what the word is in greek for fellowship maybe some of you have heard this anybody want to guess starts with a k koinonia, koinonia. thank you very much koinonia wonderful word koinonia is is let me just read these descriptive terms. It's a sharing. It's a common union. It's a communion. It is a common bond, a relationship that we have with one another. And I want to focus on the fellowship we share in the body of Christ because we share that with the Lord Jesus and the Father and we share that with believers like St. John and the men and women of that first generation, we still have fellowship with them. We have fellowship also with the believers around the world. One of the things that really kind of bugs me about the modern era, and maybe I'm old school, and it's okay, I'll get over it one of these years. This breakdown in fellowship, We've, we've witnessing the breakdown of the American family, aren't we, in a lot of ways? We've seen that. Marriage is going extinct to a great degree. We learned that yesterday, didn't we, John, with our stuff? How many are not married? Which means what? You can come and go if you just feel like it. But the breakdown of the family and the fellowship we have with others, the friendships, and forgive me for saying this so much, many people would rather just simply text somebody off of a machine than actually look at you and engage you. Now, I'm, I know I'm old school. And I have to admit, there's some people I'd rather just text on a machine. But think about what we are as human beings. God created us in what? In community. How many of you were born without a family? Or anybody around? No one here was, correct? You were born with people around you. And when we're born again and born anew into the fellowship of the body of Christ, guess what? God puts people around you, absolutely. And we need to understand that. This word fellowship is huge. It's the common union. Isn't it interesting that the word we use for the sacrament is holy? 
You know why we use that? From the word common union. You have the union of the bread and the wine with the body and blood of Christ. When we kneel at the altar, and I'm praying soon we'll be able to kneel at that altar, because you know what that kneeling at the altar shows? The common union we share as brothers and sisters at Christ, that we come and have the body of Christ, but we also then are what? The body of Christ in the flesh as brothers and sisters. And I'm telling you folks, fellowship is huge. And, this, and fellowship leads to joy. Now let me explain joy. I love this. I love this. This is biblical joy. Okay? This joy that Christ gives to us is the abiding sense of optimism. It is a cheerfulness based on God's presence even when life is not that good. Let me say that again. This joy is the abiding sense of optimism and cheerfulness based on what? God's presence in my life and yours and the fellowship we share. And it is not happiness which is based on circumstances. One of my favorite sermon texts is... Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances. And what's the third? Rejoice always. And think about that, people. In the body of Christ, even when we gather here and the casket's here and grandma or grandpa or friend died, we, what do we do? We sing. We rejoice, right? Not that the person's dead, but we rejoice in the fellowship we share with that person who now no longer lives with us here, but now lives with us in glory. So I want to focus on that for you today. Focus on the fellowship and the joy in the body of Christ that we have with the Father and the Son. We're losing that. We're losing that in America and, and in our culture and in American Christianity. And that is a tragedy. Now, before we move on, this is called incarnation theology, that God becomes flesh and dwells among us. It is flesh and blood reality. That's the world God lives in, the real flesh and blood of this world with you and me. John wrote this letter against all kinds back in the 90s, in the last decade of the first century. And you know what was going on in those days? Gnosticism. Gnosticism believed that anything physical was evil, and certainly God could not become man. God would not lower himself to the evil of this world. A lot of Gnostics back in the day, you know what they did? They removed themselves from the reality of the world. They went and lived by themselves away. Isn't it crazy? We think about that. John wrote this to show people that Christianity is not some ethereal, Gnostic knowledge, intelligence of the world. Christianity is a down-to-earth life I live of sin and grace with Almighty God day by day and with fellow believers in this life. So that brings us to the last part of our text. Would you look at your Bibles? Verse 5. So now then, how are we to live? Here it is. Will you want to join me? Verse 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is no place in us. So in the real world, what do we do? How do we live? We admit our sinfulness. In the mystical world, we say, I don't do anything wrong. I'm a good person. In the real world, people admit, I am by nature sinful and unclean. We admit our sins. We seek to change, right? We seek confession. We are repentant and we seek to change. In the unreal world, we say, well, there's nothing wrong with me. I can do what I want. And one of my people I read this week, and I thought this was important. There are two evils with which we deal in this world. And I just hold on. There's many more, but from this perspective. The first evil is the evil itself. The evil of hatred, or the evil of bloodshed, or thievery. The, whatever evil it may be, okay? But then the second evil, which is almost worse than the first, is to defend what is evil and to say it is good. Think about that. I don't know about you, but think of what is the history of the world if you know world history, you know the great, great evils have risen, correct, periodically, in nations, in governments, in societies. And that's bad enough that the evil rose and led and kind of guided the culture. But it became much worse when what? That evil was defended as what is right and good. Think of the wars that have been fought over. Think of all the evil in the world that was evil and it was known, but people said it was defended as something that was good. That's the, re that's the evil world in which we live. And the reality of God's presence is we confess our sin. We admit our evil. We don't defend it. We seek to change it. So finally, folks, I want to remind you that you and I live in fellowship with Almighty God through the person of Jesus Christ. We have a real God who came into a real world, shed his real blood, died on a real cross, buried in a real tomb, and rose from the dead in a real world new living body. So today, I want, as we continue our journey through the season of Easter, now what? What's next? It is this life we live in the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue with two things. First of all, the offering. And uh, during the singing of the hymn, if you brought an offering, there is the offering box in the center aisle. And uh, we're going to be singing the hymn for the day, which is a hymn we haven't sung in a while. It's called Thy Strong Word. We'll sing three verses. And uh, I'm going to have you stand for the third verse and remain standing as we will confess our faith on this day in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Okay? So we'll sing the uh, first two verses, stand on the last, and then confess the creed.
together on this second Sunday of Easter, we confess the faith of the, in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. Third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. For the prayers for the day, and then the closing prayers we'll come to in a little bit. Want to draw your attention to the insert? Would you take that out in your bulletin and turn to Faith and Fellowship page? Um, We have a number of people to pray for battling cancer and also those hospitalized and also with physical ailments. I want to share with you that uh, Joy Sturdivant. Uh, passed away early Friday morning. Uh, So we're going to remember Norm and the family and his sons and and family members today. She was 81 years old. Many of us knew her for for years. I've known her for 30, 32, 31 years, and some of you have known her for much longer. So we're going to pray for that family. And we're also going to pray for the vision process. Let me just share this with you. Uh, as so many of you know, probably, our congregation is in, the, in a visioning process as we look ahead to this decade and to what ministry will be and what, what areas where God is leading us to do ministry here in this place. And I want to say to you that this is probably the fourth time we've gone through this process. The last one was in 2009. And the one before that was at the end of the last century in the late 90s. And then before that was when I think I first came. We went through a visioning process, very different. And we had our meeting yesterday, and we went through some things. There's nine folks on this uh, vision planning group. And it's good we're doing this. And I want to invite you and ask you to pray for this and have excitement about this. You know, you think of so many churches that aren't looking ahead. They're not looking forward. How important it is for us to do that. So pray for God's guidance. Pray for uh, oneness in the spirit and that God would give us his vision for the future of ministry in this place. Okay? So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this day. And first of all, we pray for those, dear Lord, who are battling cancer, those who are dealing with physical ailments, and those who have been hospitalized. Dear Father in heaven, be with these individuals. And in this time of sorrow, sadness, and suffering, dear Lord, may you become a source of joy, a source of peace, in knowing that their lives are really in your hands and that there are brothers and sisters who love them and pray for them and care for them. And so, dear Lord, in the body of Christ, first of all, we pray for one another. And we pray for these people, dear Lord, that you would grant them healing and give them a sense of your presence and peace. Lord, in your mercy. We pray this day also for Norm Sturdivant and his family at the death of his wife, Joy. We thank you, dear Lord, for the 81 years of life that you have given to her and be with this family and others who mourn the death of loved ones. Dear Lord, surround them with your peace and presence as well, that even in the sadness and sorrow of the loss of loved ones, we in the body of Christ, in the fellowship of Christ, we can rejoice because we know and we believe in the life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, dear Heavenly Father, we pray 
for the vision process of our congregation. I thank you, dear Lord, for the willingness of this church to even do that, to even spend the money and take the time and the energy to evaluate where we have been and where you would lead us in the years ahead. Dear Lord, bless us in this process. Give us enthusiasm, give us joy, give us a sense of excitement in this body of Christ that you, dear Jesus, are with us. You guide us, lead us, and direct us in the years ahead. Lord, in your mercy, in Jesus' name, amen. So let us continue with the closing prayers printed out, then we'll pray the Lord's Prayer, okay? Merciful Father, through baptism, you called each of us to be your own possession. Grant that our lives may evidence the working of the Holy Spirit in love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. Empower each of us with goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, according to the image of your only Son, Christ our Lord. Everlasting Father, through your Son, you have promised the forgiveness of sins. Govern our hearts by the Holy Spirit that we may seek your help and live by faith in your word. We pray that nothing will separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Help us, O Lord, to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Dear Jesus, you are the light of the world. Fill us with joy and forgiveness and willingness to share as your dear children. Empower us to walk in the light of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit bless you this day and fill you with his peace and his joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, a couple of announcements before we sing the closing hymn. Would you turn to the inside of your worship folder and just above the memory verse, if you have it before you, uh, thank you. We received a letter of thanks from the Pacific Southwest District for our mission support last year. Uh, if you don't know this, you should know that we as a church are a tithing congregation. That means a tenth goes to missions beyond us, all right? And personally, I think that is a great, that's a great blessing from God to do that. And uh, so our district and synod, they get 50% of that tithe, and the other 50% goes to a variety of missions out there around us and, and even maybe around the world and around our country, okay? So we need to be aware of that and, uh, and, and understand that fellowship we share with fellow believers around the world. Gleaners in chapters a day, if you have a gleaner at home, and bring it, please. We're still taking them uh, to go f to the mission project of supporting students uh, in the area. And also the Bible reading schedules. If you didn't read all of them, that's okay. Just bring what you wrote or what you read, and we're starting to add those up, and uh, we'll give you a number maybe next week, okay? All right? So thank you, band. Thank you, singers, for uh, singing today. And we're going to sing one of the songs I learned as a little kid, Onward, Christian Soldiers. We'll sing three verses. Please stand for this song and sing well.
Have a good day, everybody, and Jesus bless you. And also, uh, the new portals of prayer are available for the new quarter. Have a good week, and Jesus bless you. You may, you may go. Thank <laughs> you.